In this talk, I explore how oriental bodies were deployed to represent deviant sexuality and gender um, in Soviet and post-Soviet Russian cinema. Uh, specifically, I argue that um, while Soviet cinema constructed heterosexual orientals as improperly sexual, oriental men as hypersexual and violent aggressors of the passive oriental woman, um, in order to justify colonialism as a civilizing and liberating force. Um, this heteronationalism was um, uh, was complemented by an emergent homonationalism in post-1991 Russian cinema, um, with the focus shifting in some films towards um, non-heterosexual sexuality. Um, so before I go any further, I need to explain two things, I think. Uh, what is homonationalism as a concept? And to provide some cultural context about Russian cinema and culture more broadly. So, I don't want to bore you too much with academic references, but in essence, the concept of homonationalism originates in Jasper Pure's work on US sexual exceptionalism. Um, and the introduction to her book, Terrorist Assemblage, Assemblage of Homonationalism and Queer Times, Poa provides a good working explanation of what homonationalism means. So you can read it, I think, for yourself if you want. Um, basically, Poa argues that homonationalism is a narrative that simultaneously includes certain non heterosexuals, rich, white, cis, gay men, into the nation and defines racial and religious others in terms of improper gender and sexuality at the same time. Crucially, Poir clarifies that homonationalism does not endanger heteronormativity. To the contrary, it both addresses heterosexuality as the norm and operates a commitment to the global ascendancy of whiteness by making white bourgeois marriage the ultimate aspiration for the homonationalist or acceptable gay person. Now, sorry. How does this relate to Russian cinema? First, what is Russia? I mean, I don't know. I feel like I might as well just um, explain this. The term is generally applied to four different states um, that existed and exist now. So various Eastern Slavic principalities that existed in the Middle Ages, but then became, for example, Ukraine and Russia. Then the Russian Empire that existed from 1721 to 1917, the USSR 1917, 1991, and post-Soviet Russia from 1991 until now. So I focus mainly on the Soviet and I focus exclusively on the Soviet and post-Soviet period. Um, since the dissolution of the USSR, there has been some awareness globally about the distinct identities of newly independent post-Soviet states like Ukraine, Georgia, Kazakhstan, etc. But there is still virtually no academic or media acknowledgement or conversations in the West, let alone in Russia itself, um, about the fact that both the Russian Empire and the USSR were basically Orientalist empires, and their culture, and specifically cinema, was very racist and, you know, heteronationalist, homonationalism at a later date. Not to mention that today's Russia is still an Orientalist empire. So, to kind of visualize what I'm saying, here's a 1970s National Geographic map with a really disturbing picture of a Jewish person. Um, disturbing because of the way they portray him, uh, that basically shows the main nationalities or ethnicities in the USSR. Um, overall, there were more than 200 distinct ethnic groups, ranging from the Inuit in the East to basically Ukrainian and Bel Belarus people in the West. Um, in this talk, as I said, I focus specifically on the ways Russian cinema imagines its Oriental people as gender sexual others. Um, because of that, I don't, you know, I'm not going to talk about um, the way Western, like Western people colonized by Russia, like Ukrainians or the Baltic States people were portrayed in cinema. So, how are the colonized imagined as gender sexual others in Russian cinema? Here's what Brian Byer had to say on this and one of the only books about non heterosexuals in Russian culture. Again, if you want, you can read the quote. Mm. So basically, Bayer is saying very similar things to Poir, with one crucial difference. In Russian culture, it's not just Eastern and Oriental sexuality that's constructed as deviant and abnormal, but also Western sexuality is portrayed as somehow 
inappropriate and overdeveloped, but I'm not going to talk about Western sexuality, as I said already. Um, in my opinion, this three-part geography of perversity is a useful frame for thinking about sexuality, not just homosexuality in Russian culture. In fact, the reason I prefer the term queer and que queerness to homosexuality in my work is because Russian culture and cinema in particular imagine all oriental sexualities as improper and desirable and outside the norm. The real contrast made in, by, in Russian cinema is not between heterosexual and homosexual, but between correct Russian heterosexuality and all oriental sexualities, which includes obviously homosexuality. Uh, so, because there was very little or basically no overt portrayals of homosexuality in Russian cinema from before 1989, let me briefly talk um, about, uh, let me briefly show you two examples of heteronationalism. Um, because basically the heterosexual oriental woman was the, the body used to articulate um, nationalist sexual politics in the USSR. Um, in her book, Soviet Politi Politic, oh, sorry. In her book, Soviet Politics of Emancipation of Ethnic Minority Women, um, Yulia Gratskova argues that the Soviet women's agency, propaganda films, posters, workshops, etc. from the 20s and 30s created the stereotype of a generalized Muslim woman as the main and only target for the enlightening intervention of the state. Despite the fact that Muslim women in the USSR were not actually more oppressed than other women at the time, whether they were Christian, Russian, pagan, Buddhist, whatever. In other words, the stereotype or mythology was completely arbitrary. Um, as propaganda films from the 20s and 30s, which Gratskova explores, are basically inaccessible because they have to go to the archives in Russia or in Central Asia and the Caucasus, um, I'm just going to give you three brief examples of propaganda posters that basically demonstrate what I mean. Um, this is a very early example from somewhere in Central Asia, before the language reform, which replaced um, our Arabic script with Cyrillic or um, modified Latin. Um, so you can see the woman here standing on top of her discarded veil or headscarf, holding up a red flag that reads workers of the world unite. And to the left, an old woman in a headscarf and two bearded men are pointing to a mosque, telling the young woman to go back to the mosque, I assume. Um, here's another poster from the very early 20s, uh, which is entirely in Russian, uh, meaning that it would have been impenetrable to any Muslim person, basically, because they didn't speak Russian. Um, and this poster theatrically foregrounds white Soviet woman as the Oriental woman's liberator and caters to the white colonial gaze. Um, it was produced and published in Moscow, a city that had few Muslim women at the time, for example. Um, and uses very racist orientalist conventions of representation. Uh, for example, imprecise brush strokes to make the fully veiled women at the back look like ghosts that blend into each other, the monobrows of the oriental women at the front. Um, and here's another later poster from the early 30s from Azerbaijan. So what does this have to do with gender and sexuality? In his famous paper, Algeria Unveiled, Franz Anon argued that French efforts to unveil Algerian women during the Algerian War had nothing to do with emancipating these women or empowering them to become emancipated, whatever that might mean. Um, instead, it was a calculated propaganda move to foster support for French colonization of Algeria among French people and globally. To achieve this, the French colonial, colonial administration and French women's organizations close to it exploited the tired Orientalist myth of Muslim society as, as sexually perverse and universally oppressive of women. Of course, this was ironic, given that France in the 1950s and 60s was a deeply misogynist, heteronormative, and homophobic society. Much the same can be said about these posters and propaganda films that kind of, I can't show you, as I said. Um, basically, I believe that the centering of the colonial gaze in Soviet propaganda reveals or unveils that the Soviet push to unveil um, Muslim women was a similar calculated intervention aimed at two things, to make more labor available for the state to exploit and to buttress support for USSR colonialism, for, for Soviet colonialism among the white Christian majority, Russians, but also Ukrainian, Belarus, and to Alexis and Armenians, by exploiting these um, groups' racist fears about Islamic gender and sexuality. Um, although it's centrally apparent in these posters, there's a lot of fear, for example, of the sexuality of the Muslim men. Um, um, after all, um, by selecting the veil as the principal target for the state intervention, um, these uh, films, posters, and the government in general do nothing to create awareness of pervasive oppressive structures faced by women and other gender sexual deviants 
quote unquote, um, in the USSR, which were misogyny, homophobia, and gender sexually inflected racism, which were basically sponsored by the state. It would come as no surprise then that, that even after the veil was practically eliminated, often at the expense of women being shot indoors because they couldn't go out with a veil and their husbands or fathers didn't want them to go out without a veil. Um, the racist objectification of oriental bodies did not end in Russian cinema. So let me show you, let me show you a brief cinematic example that mostly deals with heteronationalism, and then I'll move on to homonationalism. This is Leonid Gaidai's 1967 comedy feature, Woman Prisoner of the Caucasus, which released in the West under mistranslated title, Kidnapping Caucasian Style. Um, ironic on so many levels. Um, I argue that this film transparently constructs the Caucasus Mountains, which was the principal oriental site in Russian culture together with Central Asia and Crimea, as a place of gender sexual lawlessness that can only be saved through the white Russian intervention. The comedic plot revolves around um, uh, a, a model Soviet young woman, Nina, you can see her here, um, who's a student and here kissing someone in an unnamed Soviet city and a member of the Communist Party youth wing. During the summer holidays, however, she goes back to her oriental roots, staying with her uncle and aunt in an unnamed village or town somewhere in the Caucasus Mountains. Unfortunately for Nina, her uncle is the chauffeur of the corrupt party official, Comrade Sarkov, who falls for Nina and bribes her uncle into organizing a bridal abduction. As the uncle can't plausibly abduct Nina his, himself, he hires three small-time Russian criminals who have drifted into the town to do the job for him. And suspecting Nina goes on enjoying her holidays by hiking in the mountains where she meets Shurik, a Russian student on an ethnographic expedition to collect local customs, things and toasts, face foam. Um, when the criminal trio failed to abduct Nina, they convinced Shurik that she has willingly agreed to marry an unnamed guy, but according to local tradition, she must, be, she must first be abducted. Overjoyed by this opportunity to participate in a mysterious ancient ritual, Shurik abducts Nina, eventually realizes what he has done and gets her freed. The plot itself is completely orientalist and insulting to victims of gender sexual violence, but I find the visual representation of oriental people in this film even more shocking. Um, so let's look at Nina and Shurik first. Um, here is a still of Shurik and Nina walking together somewhere in the mountains. In case you're wondering why Shurik has this obviously fake blonde hair, basically the director had some weird racial hangups about skin and hair color. Um, uh, here's what Elena Proher, the, the main scholar of the director's work, had to say about it. Alexander Dimbyanyanko, um, the actor who plays Shurik, was for Gaidai the epitome of a pure soul. And in order to achieve the isomorphism, isomorphism of concept and character, the actor had to bleach his dark hair because obviously dark haired people can't have pure souls. Um, I can only assume that this weird colorism is also the reason Gaidai cast Natalia, Natalia Bali, a Romanian born actress of Welsh, Russian, French descent in the role of Nina. Although Nina is an oriental character, she's meant to be an oriental woman who has already been liberated by the Soviet state. She has passed into whiteness. As such, she's played by a white, if olive skinned actress who speaks Russian without an accent and wears relatively revealing clothing and short hair. Clothing is really crucial, I'll come back to this later. Um, compare this to the film's represent representation of oriental savages, quote unquote. Um, Nina's uncle is portrayed as a muscular, hairy, and hypersexual thug. In this still, the uncle is threatening one of the Russian criminals he hired, um, who's wearing, obviously, um, an orientalist hat, because that's what you do. Um, seeing a man's hairy, muscular chest under a thin tank top was rare in Soviet cinema. And in all Gaidai films, this kind of a shirtless or a tank top oriental man is used to symbolize kind of a British oriental or oriental character. And it, he, a character like this appears in all his films, actually, almost every, all of his films. Um, in this film, specifically, we do not see anyone, even Nina, in the greatest state of undress. But we do see oriental men engage in other un-Soviet undesirable activities. Um, here, plentiful grapes hang in Comrade Sahov's bar, suggesting that he's running a private business or embezzling produce from state-owned farms. Uh, 
In this still from the scene of a local wedding, we also see plentiful drinking. Um, excessive alcohol consumption was officially frowned upon by the Soviet ideology. As a side note, drinking is not traditionally considered to be for men in some Muslim communities in the Caucasus. Uh, more covertly, this wedding scene also unveils or hints at Russian fears about gender segregation in Oriental society, homosexuality, and maybe even sexual activity between older and younger men, which is kind of an implicit trope in Russian Soviet culture, which is rarely stated explicitly, but, it, but is centered at in many ways, not just in cinema. Kind of this idea that the Muslim society is older men sleep, sleep with younger men. Um, Interestingly, the film itself is complicit in the erasure of women. I mean, big surprise here. Um, there are only three women who speak on screen. Nina herself, a Russian doctor at the local hospital. All the doctors are white and Russian. Um, and Nina's aunt, who is pictured here. The film follows Orientalist Russian Orientalist conventions to the T, um, showing her sequestered inside the household, wearing some form of turban or headscarf, um, with a moustache and bushy eyebrows. Um, during her brief conversation with Shuri, she keeps her eyes to the ground and explains in a near whisper that in these parts, you might not even know who the groom is until the wedding day. Um, all the while, Shurik shouts and berates her. This character is actually very interesting because she knows about the kidnapping plot from the very start, but and tries and tries a, a little bit to stop her husband from doing it, but after he tells her to go back inside the house, she stays there. And the next time you see her, which is the only second time, second and only other time you see her, she's inside the household and she's not doing anything to help her niece. Although she could phone the police, for example. Um, so hopefully, my interpretation of this film and the unveiling propaganda. Unveil, sorry, I'm overusing this pun, uh, that Russian heteronationalism was at the heart of Soviet cinema and culture more broadly. That is, Russian cinema constructs Soviet colonization as the only path to civilization um, available to the Oriental woman, but she must pay a heavy price for it, renouncing her language, passing as emancipated through her appearance, and continuing to worship the Soviet phallus, which in reality is the white Russian phallus. In other words, not only is heterosexually mandatory, but it's a particular type of heterosexuality because the aunt is basically judged by the film for marrying her husband. Um, with the gradual elimination of censorship from 1986 onwards, a Russian homonationalism tentatively emerged, not challenging, but complementing the heteronationalism, as I already mentioned. Let's explore Russia's first gay feature, You I Love Ulumji, released in 2004. To be very precise, there are films that come out before that that feature like explicitly gay characters, but this is the first film to focus specifically on a gay love triangle, well, bisexual life triangle and a gay character. Um, here's what Brian Byer has to say about this film. Let me read, let me read this quote as it is quite long. Um, the tripartite developmental geography has proved to be an enduring structure within the Russian cultural imagination. Indeed, it would be difficult to make sense of the 2004 film You I Love without reference to, to it. Although the film does give a distinctly post-Soviet spin to the meanings traditionally attached to these geographic locations. In that film, a young, attractive Moscow professional, Timofey, works in an advertising firm that represents multinational corporation and is run by, a, by an English-speaking African or African-American, it's not made clear, uh, John with lecturers designed on his young male employees. Timofey begins to date another young attractive professional, Vera, who is successful and well-known television anchor woman. Timofey and Vera are in many respects representatives of the post-Yeltsin era. They have, for example, happily remained in Russia while their parents have all emigrated to the West. In one exchange, Timofey de declares, I love Russia, and Vera responds, me too. However, the hero's world is turned upside down when he meets a young Kalmyk, Ulumji, who has just arrived in Moscow and is working without documents at the zoo, one of many details linking Ulumji to the natural world. Timafei and Ulumji have an affair, although the hero maintains a relationship with the young Kalmyk. In, in the film's imaginative geography, the Buddhist Kalmyk is associated with spirituality and simple values on the one hand, and with an exclusive gay identity on the other. He's the only character in the film who is described as called boy or gay. Um, John is actually called a fag, never called a boy. But I mean, I, I, I don't have time to go into the uh, specific um, racism represented by the figure of John, um, although it's really interesting. Um, 
So this film presents a different aspect of Russian Orientalist to women prisoner of the Caucasus. Um, that film showed Islam and Muslim men as threatening matches um, and Muslim women as subdued. Religious Buddhism, on the other hand, is linked to nature and simplicity. It is a non-threatening and alluring commodity for the affluent multicultural Moscovite to possess. Once in scene in particular uh, has stuck in my mind, after Vera has finally accepted the triangular nature of her relationship with Timofey and Ulumju, um, the three have breakfast um, at, a, at Timofey's apartment. During the breakfast, Ulumji performs a Kalmyk tea ritual, explaining that his grandmother taught him this as an effective way of staving off hostile spirit. Except he, doesn't, he does not actually say this. Vera narrates this scene in a somewhat blasé, ironic tone. Then the camera cuts um, to Ulemji as a young child running around with a boyfriend in the fields of some Kalmyk village while his grandmother watches. Vera explains, again, she has the narrative authority because obviously Ulemji can't narrate his own, you know, he can't narrate his own identity, um, that Ulemji fell in love for the first time that summer. But like all first love, this one did not last, she concludes. His friend's parents pick his friend up, leaving Ulanji to stare into the distance with his grandmother watching over him. This scene is extremely orientalist for two reasons. First of all, it roots Ulanji's simple, unambiguous homosexuality as an expression of the dramatic natural topography of the mountains and turns Ulanji himself into a curious oriental product who can perform bizarre rituals for the enjoyment of his white lover. In fact, as Bayer argues, um, the film justifies Timofey's own promiscuous sexuality by um, invoking the established narrative of a Russian artist who deri derives aesthetic pleasure from men's bodies and crucially from appreciation or more accurately fetishistic consumption of other cultures. Um, so kind of Oscar, there's this narrative in Russian culture of an Oscar Wilde type ISC who is an artist who works in creative industries like Timothy does and who is homosexual, not exclusively, but because he appreciates bodily forms. Or, I mean, it's a weird, you know. Um, even before Timothy meets Ulumji, which is very crucial, Timothy participates in Orientalist consumption linked to sexual desire. For example, when he just starts dating Vera, the couple are shown trying on Islamic headwear and drinking green tea from traditional armless cups at a restaurant in the style of a Central Asian tea house. Here it is. And I'm sure for whatever reason, the first time Timafi and Vera have sex, Hindi music is playing in the background. So now I want to show you a clip. Oh no, what's happening? So this, when Ulemji and Timafi have sex for the first time, which you can see in this clip, a popular but decidedly unsexual Soviet song about taking your beloved to ride reindeer in the Siberian tundra by Kola Belde plays um, in, in the background for a good five minutes. Um, for Ulumji also makes uh, a reindeer sort of gesture with his hands. Um, Bielde, um, the author of the song, uh, is the only indigenous pop star in Russian history. Uh, he is Nana, and Nana people are native to eastern Siberia and some adjoining regions um, in the People's Republic of China. Um, Kalmyk people, on the other hand, are based in the North Caucasus and are not no, where there is basically no reindeer herding at all, no reindeer. Um, I see literally no explanation for the song being played on a loop while Timofey and Ulumji have pointedly animalistic sex, as you can see, well, whatever we call play, for, um, other than the fact that Kalmyk and Nana people look similarly exotic. After all, Timafei and the filmmakers don't really seem to care about which specific culture they are objectifying. Um, in many ways, I also wonder whether the director, the director actually wanted a quote-unquote yellow actor from Siberia for Ulamji's role, but could only find a Kalmyk. Because the film is overloaded with imagery of fur and reindeer. Let me go back to my presentation. Um, This is Kola Belde, by the way, from the song, um, from the video clip for the song. Um, yeah, 
So the film is overloaded with imagery of fur and reindeer. For example, after William G. learns that Timothy and Vera had a threesome with someone else at a private gay party, where John was attend which John was attending in um, sort of in what looked like traditional African robes. Um, Ulam Jean probably walks down a motorway in Moscow with a reindeer from the zoo. While this film constructs Ulam Jean himself as a non-threatening commodi commodity, it refuses to relinquish the myth of the, ori of, of the oriental man as a gender sexual oppressor and oriental woman as his oppressed. Once Ulam Jean's father learns about his son's homosexuality, he flights to Moscow and kidnaps Ulamji from Timafiev's apartment with the help of his brother, Ulamji's uncle. After the men do the actual kidnapping, here they are. After the men do the actual kidnapping, Ulamji's mother enters the apartment, bowing to her colonial superiors, uh, Timafiev and Vera, and asking for their forgiveness. Um, her appearance and movements are eerily similar to Nina's aunt and woman prisoner of the Caucasus, although I'm not sure why she's wearing a headscarf since she's Islamic people are not Muslim. Um, similarly, the mother seems quite, similarly to the aunt, the mother seems quietly resigned to the will of her husband. We do not know what she herself thinks about this kidnapping. A few Russian films and TV programs are as explicitly homo-nationalist as this. Um, but I want to briefly discuss a more muted example, which is the 2008 Bulgarian-Russian co-production about the so-called wars in Chechnya, which were, for the most part, punit um, punitive campaigns by the Russian military perpetrated against civilians in Chechnya in response to the country declaring independence from the USSR and Russia in 1991. Um, these reprisals lasted on and off from 1991 to 2009. If Ulamji is a story of a rich Muscovite liberals and their successful desire to own and fetch size, which is basically the same thing, poor oriental bodies and their culture, this film is a story of poor white Russians forced to eliminate the oriental body they desire because they cannot own it. Uh, the plot revolves around or, revolves around two Russian soldiers who are instructed to go to the aid of a platoon cut off by the Chechen forces somewhere in the mountains. They take a captive Chechen youth, Jamal, as their guide through the treacherous mountains. Here is one of the soldiers on Jamal. While non-heterosexual desire is never made quite explicit, the camera hints that Rubach, Rubachin, the older of the two soldiers, starts to be drawn to the slender and elegant Jamal. For instance, there are long lingering shots of Jamal washing and eating and sleeping from the soldier's point of view. The soldier's handling of the youth also becomes progressively tender. Here's another picture of Jamal. Uh, I don't want to include too many images from this film because it's kind, kind of triggering. Um, Jamal himself refuses the soldier's advances, and when the three are forced to hide in mountain undergrowth from nearby Chechen fighters, Jamal, Jamal tries to scream to attract his countrymen's attention. Um, in a chilling close-up that lasts for almost three minutes with one interruption when the camera switches direction to show Chechen fighters relaxing and eating, we see Rubahin suffocate Jamal with his hands. Crucially, after this happens, um, we see Rubahin have nightmares that are that kind of homoerotic nightmares about this episode. Uh, and this is this is all. <laughs> 